Aloha and welcome to Hawaii, the state of clean energy. I'm your host, Mitch Ewan. Our underwriter is the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, which is a program of the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. I'm very pleased to welcome our guest today, Dallas Egay. Dallas is a graduate assistance, assistant with the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, who is graduating this month and already has a new job probably because he's been working for HEPF all these uh, for the last couple of years. We're going to be talking story today about designing a road user funding system. Roads are not free. Everyone needs to pay. And Dallas has been looking at this program. I think it was your, was that your one of your thesis uh, subjects, Dallas? Yep. Uh, it was actually my, cap, my capstone paper. Uh, and so a little bit shorter than the thesis, not as in depth. What does a capstone mean? That's a good question. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, welcome to the show. And uh, just to start this going, I mean, I thought roads were covered by a fuel tax. Is there a problem? Um, that is true. Road taxes are, are, our roads are covered by our fuel tax, um, which is a primary source for transportation funding here in the US. Um, however, it's no longer gonna be a reliable source of funding. Uh, because it hasn't kept up with, largely because it hasn't kept up with inflation or improved fuel economy. So the gap between needs and, and revenues will continue to, to grow. So what's causing this gap? Well, there's several factors for that. Um, one is that, again, it hasn't kept up with, with improved fuel economy. You know, with newer cars, uh, vehicles are becoming more fuel efficient. We're also moving towards, there's been a big push recently towards clean energy vehicles, which don't contribute to uh, the fuel tax and the, uh, because they're electric vehicles. Um, and then there's also inflation as well. We haven't increased the fuel tax in, in quite some time here at both at the state level and at the, at the federal level as well. So there's a lot of different factors uh, for that. What about people who work from home now? They're not on the road as much. That, that's true. So um, very similar, you know, like the, the fuel tax is a user fee based on a user fee principle. Um, so you know, if you're not using the roadways, you, you, you don't pay for anything, right? If your car sits in the garage, you shouldn't have to pay for anything, which is understandable. But, you know, you, you do get your mail delivered and other goods and services delivered to you. So, uh, you know, and those vehicles uh, should pay, pay their fair share for using the roadways. So what's, uh, what's, uh, what are some of the solutions? I've heard something about a road user charge. What, what in the world is that? What does that yes. mean? So a road user charge system is, is uh, based on a on it's basically a tax based on on how on, on the miles that you drive. Um, so uh, basically, you know, the more you drive, the more you pay. Very similar to your utilities at home. You know, if you, the more electricity you use or the more water you use, the more you're going to pay. Um, so it's also it's called a road user charge, or also known as like a mileage based user fee, or also a, a BMT tax or vehicle mileage. Uh, tax as well. So um, there's different names for it. Um, but again, it's, it's all based on a, on a user fee principle. Okay, so uh, let's uh, flip to the next slide. And uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about this slide. This is some of your uh, investigations that you're reporting out. So tell us about this. Yeah, so just digging, looking back on, on, on how, our, how we get our transportation funding. Um, so prior to 1956, um, Fuel taxes were, were directed to the general fund uh, with no relationship between you know, the funding that was provided for roadways and the fuel taxes that were collected. Um, so as a result, um, the Highway Act of, of 1956 uh, established the Highway Trust Fund, uh, which directed fuel taxes to be used exclusively for roadway construction and, and, and maintenance. So is it actually used that way or is it like typically becomes a slush fund for the politi uh, political class to fund other projects or is it actually is dedicated to the roads? So this is actually dedicated, this is a dedicated source of funding specifically for roadway use, roadways and, and construction and, and, and maintenance. Um, it's not like the general fund where you're competing with other spending programs and, and dependent on you know, the allocations from, from Congress and whatnot. So this is a, a dedicated fund specifically for roadways. And, and to my knowledge, I don't believe we can use it for anything else. Okay, so let's uh, look at the next slide and we talk a little bit more about it. 
So, uh, you know, your first bullet here says that the, uh, these taxes uh, don't cover the total cost of the roads. So how do we make up the difference? Yeah, so the, the, what I mean by that uh, I, is that it's not linked to the type of road or the frequency of use. So, for example, you know, the, the highways or, or freeways are getting much more usage than, you know, your common residential roadways, right? But yet you're not paying a different type of tax for that type of road that you're using. Um, in addition to that, you know, frequency of use, you know, when, you know, someone may drive only, you know, once a day, for, and whereas someone else may be on the road all day long, you know, someone driving Uber, for example, is going to be on the road a lot more longer than someone who's just going to and from work or, or, or dropping off, you know, their kids at school. Um, so right now it's not, it, the fuel tax is not really designed for that. Um, and especially with the way all of our new vehicles are, are, are now where they're much more efficient. So basically you're penalized for having an older vehicle and, and those who have newer vehicles are paying less into the system, right? Um, so that's, that's what I mean by so. Because the car is more efficient, they're not using as much gasoline. Yes. So what's on a cents per gallon, can you give us some idea of what, what the current tax is when I go and buy a gallon of gasoline? Like I did last night and it took me $81 to fill my tank. I had shock, I was shocked. Yes, you and myself as well. And many, many others are, are feeling the, the pain at the pump right now with, with, the, with rising prices. Um, so right now the fuel tax, you know, no, no matter how high gas prices have increased, it's, it's, it's a flat tax and it's not indexed to inflation or the price of fuel. Um, so right now, I think at the federal level, it's about 18 cents per gallon. And at the state level, it's another 16 cents per gallon. And I believe there's a, a, a cents or two, a, a couple pennies or so that's going for the county fuel taxes as well. But all of it is a flat, ta flat, flat tax. Um, and it's not, you know, again, not based on the price of gas right now at the pump or, or you know, tied to inflation for that matter. And again, it hasn't increased in quite some time. So uh, uh, the, your third bullet says uh, it doesn't account for other indirect costs, such as congestion, accidents, and air pollution. So um, where where do we pay for those sorts of things if it's not coming out of the fuel taxes? So that that's a great question. Uh, we actually don't pay for that right now. Um, so and, and that is a that is a problem. One of the one of the problems with the current fuel tax is that we we don't pay for that right now. Um, and some economic analysis by, um, by one of the economists, uh, Perry et al., um, he actually estimated an additional tax of, of $2.10 per gallon, which would include about a dollar for congestion, uh, 60 cents for accidents, and another 40 cents pollution. So as you can see, taxes wow. should be much higher than they really are. Is that why they pay so much for their fuel in uh, Europe and other countries, and we're getting a free ride? Or is that why our roads are like, you know, some roads are in really good shape, but I noticed the leaky leaky is in horrible shape and uh, it's just ripping the heck out of my tires. I've noticed it's just like they've been through a buzzsaw. Now, is that, should I be talking to the county or is that a, is, or is that a federal road? I believe that there might be a state roadway, uh, I believe. Uh, the, the federal level would be mainly just, you know, the H1, H2, H3 here on right. Oahu. Um, at the at the state level, I believe, like Leaky Leaky and Poly Highway, I believe those are, are state roadways. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, it's getting pretty bad, especially with all the rain. When we get a lot of rain, it washes out all the small bits, and you're left with the big chunks that in the roadway that rip up tires. So it's like unbelievable. I looked at my tires the other day, and I couldn't believe it. Wow. <laughs> going to have to go and buy some new ones pretty soon. So let's uh, flip over to the, the next slide. So uh, in this, uh, let, explain what I'm seeing here, Dallas. All right. Okay. So yes, I, I know that chart looks a little little busy. Um, so what we're looking at there is the federal fuel tax rate um, in the blue bars, uh, which is not indexed to inflation, um, which has gone up by almost 80% from 1993 to, to 2020 there. I know it's quite small, so I'm not sure if the viewers can see that. But uh, the next green bars that you see, there, the next set of bars that you see is, are those green bars. Um, and that's basically if, it, saying that if the federal fuel tax rate was in, uh, indexed to inflation, um, it would be actually increasing over time and would be about 33 cents per gallon with, um, at, at the, at, in 2020. Um, so as a result of, of not adjusting to inflation, you know, the federal 
uh, fuel tax revenues have, has decreased in purchasing power by about 45% or 44% over those same years, which you can see in that red line pointing down. So that's not a good thing then. No, it's not. No, it's not. Okay, let's uh, next slide. Um, so, you know, I, I used to live in England for many years, actually, and it was unbelievably expensive to buy fuel there. So talk to us about the U.S. I think we, yeah, you talked to this slide. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not the one giving the pitch here. So go ahead. Um, yeah, so you're absolutely right. Um, so compared to other OECD countries, uh, the United States actually has one of the lowest fuel tax rates in the, in, in the world. Um, and on the opposite end of that spectrum is the United Kingdom. And, and you're absolutely right. They actually have the highest tax, uh, fuel tax rate uh, when it compared to other OECD countries. So um, as a result, and largely this is because we haven't increased the tax rate. And you know, so like, like I mentioned, like we saw on the, the slide before was 1993 was the last time we increased the federal fuel tax rate. So you know, almost 20 years. And, and, and as a result of that, you know, our, we have one of the lowest taxes in, in, the, in the world. Yeah. Yeah, it uh, makes your eyes water when you do a fill over in England. And so, so people are very careful about how they use their cars. So I think uh, we got hit like, what, six or seven years ago when oil was up over $140 a barrel. And it really changed everybody's driving habits. You know, instead of just going to the store willy nilly to pick up a gallon of milk or something like that, people started planning their trips. And I think the vehicle miles traveled dropped like about 20 to 25%. And the interesting thing is the policy forum uh, did a survey and uh, once uh, oil went back to its normal price, it should be around $80 a barrel. Um, and everybody started driving the way they did, but used to, but not all, all the way. So the net result was we dropped by about 10 to 15% in our vehicle miles traveled. Uh, so it didn't snap back right back the way it was. People learned the lesson. Uh, about that. So um, if we go to the next slide, we can talk a little bit. We, I think you brought it up. You mentioned it that, uh, you know, the fuel efficiency. Talk about the fuel efficiency of uh, passing your cars and where we're going. Yep. So, so this chart here that we're looking at is the corporate average fuel economy standard for passenger vehicles. Um, yeah, as you just mentioned, uh, we did talk about this a little bit briefly earlier about how you know, fuel efficiency of new cars are, are going up. Um, so you, what you see there in the last several years, you can see that it went up from, you know, it was flat for from about just under 30 miles per gallon for quite some time. And then all of a sudden, if you look at the most recent year, it's all the way up to about 44 miles per gallon. Um, so as a result of this improved uh, fuel efficiency and, and no tax increase to keep up with inflation, you know, again, that gap between revenue and needs continues to, to widen. Um, and, and like you mentioned just earlier, um, how, you know, vehicles miles, vehicle miles traveled has, hasn't really quite picked up too. Um, so as a result, that, that means there's less revenue going into the system. Um, so as a result of these kind of things, these different factors, um, Congress has to help to, in order to cover the shortfall, uh, Congress actually has to make annual transfers from the U.S. Treasury General Fund into the Highway Trust Fund each year just to make up for that, that uh, funding difference. So how, how hard are we hurting? How bad are we hurting? I mean, is it is this now really getting onerous? I mean, are people starting to panic a little bit uh, at the uh, federal and state agencies who uh, who manage this this funding? Yeah, so I, I don't know if pa panic is the right word um, because you know we we the, at the federal level they they have done some studies about this. Uh, a few years, few years ago, and, and many states are starting to st study that now at the state level. Um, so uh, we are aware of the funding situation. Um, so I don't know if, yeah, we're not really panicking just yet, but what is of concern is that, you know, as we move towards a, a clean energy future and you're hearing about, you know, a lot of the um, car manufacturers that are no longer uh, making uh, gas combustion vehicles anymore, they committed to making clean energy vehicles by you know, 2030 as an example, um, that, that is a, a concern, you know, for our long-term future. Short-term wise, you know, we can probably find different ways to make up for the funding, but long-term wise, we, that it's gonna be, a, it's gonna potentially be a problem for us or likely be a problem for us. 
So let's talk about solutions. I think you have some. We start talking about it in your next slide. Our federal government has it has been aware of this uh, problem for quite some time. Um, and in 2005, uh, they established the National Service Surface Transportation Infrastructure Financing Commission, uh, which you know assessed future investment needs, and they wanted to evaluate the future of that highway trust fund and explore different funding mechanisms. So as a result of this study. Um, a road user charge system uh, emerged as a consensus choice of the future um, because it ensures all users will pay the fair share for using the system. Um, so you can see there on that side, a lot of some of the key advantages uh, such as collecting adequate revenues from fuel efficient vehicles and implementing variable pricing based on actual costs imposed on the transportation system. So this is something that I, I talked about earlier, how you can, you can adjust the pricing based on the type of road that you're using or you know, the frequency as well of, of using that system. Let's talk about social justice and, you know, our lower income people can't afford to buy a brand new car every year that's, that's the most efficient. So aren't they getting hammered uh, by this? I mean, first of all, um, they have to seek uh, cheaper accommodation, which is further away from the city core and probably further away from where their actual job is. So they actually have quite a long way to commute. So they're going to have to pay additional money uh, for uh, for their gas, and then a, a road user fee is going to come in. It's going to make it even more expensive for them. Uh, so how do we how do we address that? How do we accommodate the uh, lower income groups? You know, who don't have an efficient car. They have an old banger that's very inefficient. So they're using more fuel than they need to, and uh, they're living far away. And they, but they still have to commute to their jobs. So how can we help them and, and, and what kind of schemes are in place to try to address that? Yes, yeah, so that, that's a great question. And, and you're absolutely right. You know, right now in the current system with the fuel tax, um, you know, rural and, and, and folks that use uh, older vehicles are actually being penalized quite a bit, you know, uh, um, because as a proportion of, of their income, you know, they're, they're paying more into the system because they're, if they're driving an older vehicle, you know, it's less fuel efficient. They've got to put more gas into their cars more frequently um and on top of that too, if you're driving further if you live further away then you're driving more then that means you're also gonna have to put gas in it so they're contributing a lot more into the system than than somebody who has a new car um so um there has been some studies done of, of, about this particular issue um and what they found was that you know while rural drivers have longer trips they make them less frequent whereas urban drivers tend to make shorter trips but make them more frequently so overall they're you know, both urban and, and rural drivers are driving about the same same distance. Um, and then, as you mentioned earlier about you know low income vehicle, low income uh, uh, drivers and rural drivers driving you know older vehicles, um, these are much you know less fuel efficient. So they're actually paying you know again more into the into the system as well. So you know by moving to a road user charge road user charge system, they would actually be, be paying less in in that same system than what they're currently paying right now. So when you were doing your um your thesis or your capstone project. Um, it's not reflected in these slides, but did you look at the effect of public transportation? Because if we had a great, a really great transportation system and a public transport, I know the uh, Oahu transportation system is a pretty good system. I think they consistently uh, win awards and, and are rated very highly, but how does that affect the, uh, the, uh, the, fuel, uh, the fuel tax? or the collections for the fuel tax? So I, I did not look at the impact from, from public transportation. And, and you're right, yeah, Hawaii, you know, historically has had, you know, one of the better transportation systems, public transportation systems in the, in the US. That's won, you know, some awards and whatnot. Um, so I, I, I can't really speak to that uh, per, per se, but, um, that that I mean, anytime you can get less people on on the roadways and using mass transit, that's that's always a, a positive thing, you know, from from a, a public transport public perspective, I guess. But you know, from a revenue perspective, that means there's less revenue going in, into the system. Um, so it's you know, it's one of those trade offs, right? It's like okay, if, you know, that means there's there's less people driving. It's great for the environment. It's great, you know, for congestion. But then that means there's less revenue going into the system. Um, so that's that's an area that I I did not explore. Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe it's something you do when you go for your PhD. <laughs> so, so uh, what about other countries? If you have our next slide up on road user charges, 
So what have you discovered? What, what, what do, do, do any other countries have a solution to this that, that's working? Um, so to, to date, uh, no country has developed a, a comprehensive uh, system to charge user fees for all vehicles and roadways. Um, there's some countries like New Zealand, for example, that have uh, a road user fee for, for heavy trucks, um, but at not, no, no country has it at the, at the, you know, at the, at, at the you know, comprehensive system for all vehicles, I guess. Um, so recently in the US, uh, they began studying uh, road user charge fees um, through that program that I mentioned uh, on the slide before, I believe. Um, and they have funded about 24 pilot programs in, in 10 different states. Um, so in 2015, uh, Oregon became the first state to implement a voluntary road user charge system followed by Utah in 2020. Um, Oregon's program is open to all vehicles while Utah's program is available only to electric and, and hybrid vehicles. And it basically serves as a replacement for that alternative fuel vehicle fee, which is something we also have here in, in Hawaii. Um, and then as of you know, 2022, um, these are the only two states that have implemented a, a statewide uh, program. And what was the response from the community? Was it accepted that like, uh, like everybody just throws up their hands and say, okay, yeah, I guess I have to pay this or what was kind of the response? So I, I think the approach, that's a really good question. And I think the, the approach that they use is, is really important and, and key for, uh, for states as, as we start to, or as we think about implementing this is, is that they made it voluntary. Um, so for Oregon, for example, they started off with the program limited to 5,000 vehicles in the first initial years, and then they expanded it to all vehicles because of the popularity. So I, I think that kind of speaks for itself about how popular it, it was. Um, but they also conducted pilot programs, you know, to help educate the public. They also conducted outreach. Um, so it wasn't, you know, all that new when they actually decided to roll it out uh, to the public. Uh, but I, again, the key is that, you know, just making it, giving people an option, you know, hey, you, you can either pay your, your current fuel taxes or you can use this road user fee uh, system and, and give it a try. And I think what they also did was they also made it so it's revenue neutral so that, you, you know, they look at your, you know, some whatever, for states that record, record your, uh, your mileage, like here in Hawaii, as part of your annual vehicle inspection, you know, they know how much you're driving each year. So as a result of that, you can calculate how much you're paying in fuel taxes. Um, so what they, by making it revenue, revenue neutral, you can say, hey, I, you know, I'm going to charge you a road user fee up until that fixed amount and anything more than that, you, I won't charge you anything more. So that, that's another way to get people to buy into the, to the new system as, as well. So, you know, just and because all we want to do at this point is just preserve revenue, right? We don't want to, we've seen some of the charts before where revenue is declining. So we're, we just want to stop the bleeding effectively, right? So if you want, if you can just keep it neutral and revenue at flat, then I, th I think that's, that's a win for now in the short term. So when you go to your uh, PhD, your next phase of your education, what sort of research questions are you going to be looking at? For my paper, I looked at these three different research questions. Um, and center basically around like how can it be best to implement it to foster a policy, the variety of, of, of policy goals, you know, some, what are the major limitations and then what are the strategies that can be used to gain public support? So some of the, those last two questions um, we kind of touched on a, a little bit, right? The concerns that, that we talked about like rural and low income drivers and, you know, some of the strategies uh, like making it voluntary, also making it, you know, capping it so that you, you don't pay no more than what you're currently paying right now. Um, so th those are some of the things that, I, that we uh, that I looked at, and then going forward, you know, further research is, is still needed to, you know, right now a lot of these states that did these pilot programs, they just looked at it, looked at it from a perspective of preserving revenue. Uh, future pilot programs need to look at, you know, how it can, you know, change behavior, like you mentioned, you know, like hey, using public transportation, what are the impacts to that, um, and also using like like that variable fee that I kind of briefly touched on as well, you know, setting the different rates based on the type of road that you're using. Um, you can also use it for congest congestion pricing, you know, for example, like what you see like in London, and I think it's also rolling out in, in New York. Um, yep. So there's, there's a lot more research that needs to be done. And, and, and um, in addition to these, there's also things like, you know, we haven't really looked, studied, there hasn't been too many studies done on, on commercial vehicles as, as well, you know, from delivery trucks to heavy trucks to tour buses here in Hawaii. And, and, and even, you know, look at all of our city buses that are now electric, right? So. Um, there's, there needs to be more research done at the, at the commercial level as well. But I know for those vehicles, you know, they do pay other types of taxes, like a tire tax a, a, as well. So, um, and that's something that I did not explore in, 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 my, in my research. 
not something you can do for your PhD, right? Yes. So, so let's look at the methods you would use. That's the next slide coming up. Study. Um, I, I just looked at, I did like a systematic review of the five different pilot programs um, in California, Washington, Oregon, Colorado, and also here in Hawaii, believe it or not. Um, and the reason I chose these five programs uh, was because these, they were the only states that completed the programs using both manual and automated reporting options. So a manual reporting option is, is uh, basically just taking a photo of your odometer reading. Or here in Hawaii, we, we capture that information already as part of the annual vehicle inspection, right? Um, and then the automated option would be using like a little smartphone app that can record, you, you know, that's GPS based that would record the number of miles as you drive, or also like a plug in device that goes into like your OBD2 system into your car that automatically records the mileage that can report it uh, back to, to the state. Um, so, based on those, those five different pilot programs, um, I, I created a, a, a rubric. Um, to you know, look at the different policy goals based on the different capabilities of each of these mileage reporting options. And then I also looked at like some of the limitations from, from secondary research uh, to come up with a few recommendations. Okay, so uh, we're closing in uh, to going towards the end of the show here. So let's, uh, sh what kind of concerns uh, should, we be concer should we be concerned about or have been expressed? Yep, so the, the biggest one um, is, is privacy. Uh, you know, anytime you have a GPS based device, people are always worried about tracking. Um, so that, that's been the number one concern based on my research that I've seen. Um, but the, the thing to remember with, with, this, pro, with this new system is that, um, you know, again, one is voluntary and two, we're allowing, because we're giving people different options to report their mileage, you know, using man, manual and automated options, you know, people have a choice. They don't have to use a GPS-based device. That you know, if you're not comfortable with that, that's fine. Just do like the odometer reading, and you can report it. You know, you don't even have to report it here like, when you if if you live here in Hawaii because it's already been captured. So there's different ways around that that privacy issue as well. Um, but that's that's been the big one. Um, the rural and low-income drivers. We, we did talk about that earlier on the show. Um, electric vehicles. Um, you know, some are concerned that it's going to be higher cost for EVs because right now, you know, they only pay a fat, flat fee uh, for an EV. They're, they don't, they're not paying any um, gas, tax, gas taxes. But again, based, you know, uh, based on what we talked about earlier, you know, hey, everyone needs to pay their fair share for using the roadway. You know, just, you know, not everyone can afford an electric vehicle. And right now, you know, those people who are, have the electric vehicles are, are not paying anything into the system. And then finally, uh, the last one is about a double taxation. Some people worry about, you know, you're going to pay both a fuel tax and a, a mileage based tax um, when, when that's not true. Uh, you know, the, the road user charge fee would basically be a replacement to the fuel tax. Not, it's not going to be a double tax. So that also be, needs to be made clear as well. Conclusions. We're down to our last slide. So what were your conclusions from uh, based on your study, Dallas? Um, so based on my study um as i kind of mentioned uh you know if the road user charge system is, is a promising alternative uh for the fuel tax as it not only offers a more stable source of funding but can also support additional policy goals um you know the state pilot programs um using a fixed fee proved that it that's that's feasible and, and it can at least preserve revenue um however you know more research is still needed to understand you know a variable fee per mile and, and how it can be used to change travel behavior um so Right, right now, you know, in the short term, um, gaining public support for replacing the fuel, fuel tax with a road user charge system is probably the most important right now in the near term. Yeah, I think most uh, reasonable people will understand that, you know, if you don't pay, the roads are going to really uh, turn, turn into a horrible mess. And it affects the maintenance on their cars because they're going to have to buy new tires like me. So I really like to thank you, Dallas, for all the work you've done uh, to get this started. And I hope that you continue your studies and help uh, all of us uh, have better roads here in Hawaii. And so I've been talking with uh, Dallas Ige, and we've been talking story about paying for Hawaii's roads, the problems, and what options we have to make sure everyone pays their fair share. Thank you so much, Dallas, for uh, all your good work. And good Thank luck you. in your new career. Thank you for having me. And thanks to our viewers for tuning in. I'm Mitch Ewan. We'll be back in two weeks with another edition of Hawaii, the state of clean energy.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.